Wow, this is the best attended celebration of faculty affairs or faculty careers that I have seen so far. So everybody wants to see what Keenum has done and even more so figure out what, or hear what he's going to think about doing in the future. So for those of you that don't know, this Celebration of Faculty Careers is an initiative that was started in the College of Engineering as part of our strategic plan. And the first part is that, uh, you know, in terms of post-tenure, once you become a full professor, then uh, in terms of, of other opportunities for evaluation, then uh, uh, there aren't that many, although we all know that we're evaluated all the time. So we decided that we would like to hear from some of our full professors, or actually from all of them. So after about seven years, after their last promotion, then they become eligible to share with us the achievements as they see them uh, over their career and their plans for the future. And then they begin to lay out that plan with their heads and with the, the deans of the respective colleges. The other thing is that we have a promotion and tenure process, and part of that is to develop leadership. And we would like to very much uh, incorporate some of our lessons learned along the way uh, into that process as we uh, develop our young faculty. This started in the spring of 2013 on a pilot basis and then has been fully implemented in uh, the last couple of years. So let me tell you a little bit about <coughs> Professor Park. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in pharmaceuticals and this was just a few years ago, 1983. After doing postdoctoral training in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Wisconsin, he joined the faculty of uh, Purdue in 1986, so he went through pretty quickly. He was promoted to full professor of pharmaceutics in 1994, but since 1998, he's had a joint appointment in the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. And we were very excited that he became the Showalter Distinguished Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue in 2006. Now his contributions have ranged from really fundamental research to entrepreneurial types of activities. And so it'll be particularly interesting to see what his own perspective is relative to his achievements and to hear what his plans for the future might be. So rather than trying to guess, I'll just turn the floor over to Kino. Well, thank you, Malba. Um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I think I have a microphone. Uh, today I'd like to talk about what I have done, if I have done anything, briefly about next 40 minutes. Let me begin with, um, as Melba said, I came to Purdue in 1986 as an assist assistant professor. In 1990, I became an associate professor. In 1994, I became a full professor. <laughs> this is not a typo. <laughs> So after becoming a <coughs> full professor, I was wondering, what do I really need to do to be better? Okay, so I decided to be, uh, change myself from full professor to fulfilling professor. And the question I had was this. This is, by the way, Purdue symbolized three tri two triangles and square here, teaching, research, service. I really don't know how triangle means teaching, but that's what it is. So the question I had is, how many papers do I have to publish? How much research money do I have to bring in? How, much, how many committee members should I become? What do I need to do to be a good professor? That was a question to, probably many of you may have the same question, okay? The graduate students, new professors, what do I need to do to, to be better? Okay, that is a question that almost everybody has. So it was not difficult to me. I didn't know what was the criteria to really get promotion or go to the next level. How many papers should I publish? It's a question, okay? So it's always not clear to me what I need to do. And then over years, I happened to listen to this song this is Whitney Houston, uh, the song titled One Moment in Time. This is a song that she sang for the Olympians, for US Olympians for 1998 
Seoul Olympic. Okay, here's a lyric. Actually, this is a fascinating thing. Let me read a few of them, okay? Each day I live, I want to be a day to give the best of me. Okay? I live to be the very best when I'm more than I thought I could be, when all my dreams are hot be the way and the answers are up to me, then in that one moment of time, I will be free. That's the goal. You'll be free, okay? You know, I'll be free has a very significant meaning. We'll talk about this a little bit later too. So this is answer. I'm not gonna compete with others. That was never my goal. I don't wanna compete with others. Think about it. There are more than seven billion people on earth. Who do you compete with? Whatever you are, whoever you are, there are many, many people who are better than you at the same time. There are billions and billions of people who are not as well off as you are. What is the point of comparing yourself with others? There's no point of competing with others. And this is the answer. You just compete with yourself. So my goal was to be the best of me. That's all I want to do. That's all I can do. I think many of you really think about this, that your goals in your life may become a little more clearer. Instead of trying to write one more paper, think about what you can do to be the best of you. That's the goal. Okay. Once I had this clear goal, to reach the best of me, I think you, we need to have a passion. If you don't have a passion in what you do, every day will be very difficult. Okay, every day will be very stressful. But if you have a passion in what you do, everything you do is a joy. Okay, this is what basically Steve Jobs described very well. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. He just loved to make so-called insanely good product. He just dedicated all the time. Okay? But he never felt this stressful. That's what he loved to do. Okay? So the question he asked was, if today were the last day of my life, what I want to do is what I'm about to do today. You see, this is a good question to ask. So if you really like what you do, like a Confucius said, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Okay? Confucius is a very famous person from China his wordings are sometimes very confusing. That's why we're calling Confucius. <laughs> One of the person who is so passionate about what he did that is, is uh, uh, Ovil Redenbacher. He's a Indiana native. He got a BS degree in agriculture from Purdue. And he studied growing corn in Valpresso, Indiana, which is only an hour away from here. And 20 years later, he made a perfect popcorn. Go to YouTube and type in his name. You can see all his commercials. It's just wonderful. You can see him. He loves what he does, okay? So what can be better? He decided to make the best popcorn in the world. He made it. I mean, what can be more fulfilling than this? Okay? So you must have a passion in what you do. I happen to have a passion in drug. Not the drug you can buy on the street, but drug <laughs> and drug delivery system. Okay? So in, if you look at the history of uh, uh, American drug uh, industry, then 100 years ago, these are called so-called patent medicine, not because they are patented, but because they don't want to show what's inside, because patent is so you don't have to expose anything. It's confidential. But most of these drug contain snake oils, cocaine, heroin, almost thing that you don't want to really inject into your body. So there are a lot of problems over the years. And only 1930s, 50s, 60s, government tried to change it. So 1965, I think, President John F. Kennedy passed a law for any drug on the market should go through careful scientific study to make sure they're safe and effective. That's only six years ago. Okay. So anyway, currently we have a very, very safe and effective drug 
formulation because of that. And each year, there are about a dozen of formulations that make uh, at least billion dollars a year. One product make more than billion dollars a year that's called blockbuster drug. There are about a dozen of them. And I'd like to point out a couple of them here. One of them is Nexium esimepazole, but this is a second generation drug. The first generation drug is called omeprazole. This is a drug called proton pump inhibitor. A lot of people have too much acid in the stomach. So they have a stomach ulcer, all kinds of problems. According to statistics, about one third to one half of the whole population has an acid problem. So they had to go to hospital, have a surgery to correct their problem. It's a serious problem, and this omeprazole changes all that. Okay? By taking one, tap, one pill a day, you reduce the acid secretion so much, all the problem gone. I'm taking this every day too. A lot of people take it. So this significance of this drug is to that of penicillin. It changed the human history. But this drug, proton pump inhibitor, is unstable in the acid in the stomach. So it has to formulate in such a way that it doesn't dissolve in stomach, but go to intestine and dissolve. So that is formulation called anti-coding polymers. So this is a simple formulation, but it changed the whole, you know, the, so many problem is gone because of just one drug. So this is where drug delivery system becomes very useful. Another drug I'd like to point out is Seroquel. This is a quetiapine delivery system. This is a depressive disorder. One drug makes a lot of uh, money, more than a billion dollars. We're talking about a few billion dollars. Apparently, in America, there are a lot of depressive people. But I don't know why, but people take too much drug anyway. The reason that this particular drug makes so much money is because people have to take every day forever. Yeah. In any case, this drug used to be twice a day formulation. If you take twice a day, this is convenient, but it's not as convenient as once a day. If twice a day, you still tend to forget, but once a day, when you wake up in the morning or you go before going to bed, you take once. Then you take off 24 hours. It's very, very convenient. So by simply making twice a day into once a day formulation, they become blockbuster drug. Okay, so drug delivery system, the goal is to make drug more effective to increase patient convenience and compliance. Okay. So <clears throat> drug delivery technology history is literally only 65 years old. It started from 1950. In 1952, we saw the very first controlled drug delivery formulation. That is called Contact 600. Before this time, before this formulation, many of you are very young, so you don't know what, how many formulations we take every day. But in old days, we take drug four times a day. Four times a day. It's very, very inconvenient. Think about it. You take a medicine 6 o'clock in the morning, noon, 6 o'clock in the evening, and midnight. You have to wake up, sleeping boy, and give the medicine and go back to sleep. Three times a day is a little better, still not quite convenient. But twice a day, a lot more convenient. You wait at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 p.m. in the evening. That's OK, right? So twice a day. This is the very first control release formulation allowing you to take medicine twice a day. Very, very convenient. Okay? This is based on coding drug. This is a drug particle itself. So it releases right away. It lasts only three hours. But the formulation scientists coat the drug with the polymer layer, which dissolves in three hours. So after three hours, you have another dose. This one, thicker coatings, after six hours, after nine hours, you release more drugs. So you last 12 hours. Okay. This is a very simple but very clever formulation. So this is the very beginning. And after that, there are a lot of technology developed. Most of the drug delivery technology we use today are developed during the first 30 years. 
You see, you, whenever you take any medicine, whenever it says once a day, some of this technology is involved. Okay? So it's very, very convenient. But second generation, from 1980 to 1920, technology was advanced far more than the first generation, but its translation to clinical application has been very, very slow. And here's the reason. The first generation, mostly the formulation is about oral delivery and transdermal patch, which is easier to handle. The second generation, we're talking about delivering insulin to the diabetic patient, and mostly about nanotechnology. So last 15 years, we spent so much time and resources in nanotechnology, but the result has not been really good. As you know, there are really not much clinical application. We'll talk about this a little more later to make my point. So now we are into the third generation. We are still talking about nanotechnology, but we need to develop much more technologies to make a variety of drugs a little better. I have been interested in several research areas, including oral delivery, long-term delivery. This is if you have a one shot of formulation, the drug lives for a month, three months, or six months, or even longer. That's the whole idea. And local delivery to, from a drug eluting stand to release a drug only around certain areas. And also targeted delivery to deliver a drug to the target side, mostly about tumor. That's because that's the most important disease too. And also recently we started a digital human project. Now, let me briefly describe a few of them, because time limitation, I don't want to go into all of them. But let me start with the gas retention device here. This is the thing that I try to develop to make a once a day formulation, because when you have a breakfast, lunchtime, you become hungry again. After lunch, you become hungry again for dinner. That's because the stomach tries to digest and squeeze everything into intestine, so you become hungry again. So drug delivery system is the same thing. If you swallow something, the body tries to remove it into the intestine. So it emptied from the stomach in about maximum two hours. That's why you cannot have a drug delivery system once a day is not that easy. Yeah. So I, my idea was to swallow small hydrogel and then it swelled in the stomach to a larger size so it doesn't it cannot pass through the stomach into the intestine, and then eventually it will degrade by enzyme in the stomach. So here's one example. The hydrogel I made was, the goal is that the hydrogel should swell very fast before stomach squeeze everything into the intestine. So this is a real-time video showing fast swelling up gel to a large size. The key is a large size, okay? So you can see here another example. Regardless of the size, the water absorbed right away become big. So the idea of making once a day formulation turned into making diet control pill. Whenever you feel hungry, you have a few capsules, then your stomach is full, so you're not gonna be hungry anymore. That was at least the idea, but it has not worked so far yet, but we keep trying. Okay? Now, another one I want to talk about is fast dissolving tablet. The idea is that whenever you need a medicine, you open your tablet, put it in your mouth, and even without water, it dissolves in your mouth and you can swallow. So you can have medicine anytime, anywhere you want. So this is a tablet. If you put into, I just dye water red so you can easily see it. If you put Imagine you put this into your mouth and your saliva has that much volume, then water sucks into the core right away and it becomes disintegrated and you can easily swallow. Swallowing tablet, no matter how small, is very difficult, but swallowing liquid like that is very easy, just like swallowing your saliva. So this is uh, actually the technique that I use to make actual commercial product, and here I made the uh, coffee mazia. This particular tablet has 75 milligram caffeine. 
So if you put it into your mouth, it slowly melts, then you have one cup of coffee. But commercially, this was not successful. I have a calcium tablet, variety of tablet. This has a, a French vanilla -like cappuccino. We have a caramel mocha, all kinds of even better than Starbucks coffee flavors. <laughs> but it didn't really work well because I misunderstood. If you have a good technology, people may buy product, but not. People's habit is you have to have a hot coffee drinking slowly over time. Nobody want to put the tablet in the mouth and I have a coffee, you know, it doesn't work that way. So this is one thing I want to tell you. A lot of people I met at Purdue always said, I have a great technology. If you make this into product, you'll be successful tomorrow. But usually not the case. Okay? Technology is only about 20% maximum. The rest of it is how to marketing this thing. Okay, so this is a lesson I learned hard way, but you need to be careful when you have a new technology. Trust me, it's not gonna go to be big success overnight. Okay, you need to have a careful partner who knows how to sell this thing. The okay? so point is that whenever you have a new technology, you have to understand well, how we can make this into a successful product. We just don't know what features will make a successful product. There's just no rule, no nothing. We just don't know. You have to try, okay? So let me show you how marketing is important. You know, this is a story of a Coca-Cola. You can see title, how Coke convinced us to pay more for less soda. This is actually featured in Time Magazine, okay? This is a street vendor selling Coca-Cola. So if you look at this alone, there's nothing unique about it, okay? But if you look closely, people passing by, actually this is smaller than people have to kneel down to talk to the guy inside. This vending machine here is so small, you have to kneel down, okay? You can see how small it is by seeing people standing up. And Coca-Cola has a brilliant commercial here, okay? Coca-Cola starts selling mini Coke. This is 7.5 ounce Coke. This is regular 12 ounce Coke. And people feel less guilty buying mini Coke and drink it than regular Coke. Because less volume, right? Less calorie. Most amazing thing is that Coca-Cola charge the same amount of money for both. People pay the same amount for less. People don't complain. Even more amazing is people drink less so that they feel like, oh, I can have another drink. So they can buy two. <laughs> but think about it. You pay the same amount of money for less and you pay twice. But people still feel happy. This is where commercial success and nobody can predict. So Coke has simple idea. It's the little thing in life that make you happy. Why you feel happy because you feel, assume that you drink less. Coca-Cola is happy because they make more money. Everybody's happy, right? This is what power commercial is. Okay? I'd like to briefly spend some time about this uh, targeted delivery to make the point I'd like to make today. As I said, uh, we are into the third generation of drug delivery system. And if you recall, last 10 years is all about nanotechnology. Okay? I'm just so wondering how in the world, everybody in the world, not only USA, Europe, Japan, Asia, everywhere, everybody talks about only nanotechnology. I just have no clue. But look at, look at Google or whatever, look at, uh, go to uh, NanoGob or something. Beginning of nanotechnology is based on one assumption. Nanoparticle will have a different properties because it has a huge surface area. 
That is only assumption that began whole nanotechnology fail. It was only an assumption, no evidence. And that is the result now. Look at, even at Purdue, I'm not gonna you know, mention, but there are a lot of faculty who said using nanoparticles, I have a better glucose sensor. I tried it, it doesn't work. Okay? Simply believing just because it's nanotechnology, it'll be better is a pure assumption which is not quite true anymore. Okay, so this is the point I'd like to make today. I happen to have a chance to work editing two books. One is Cancer Targeted Drug Delivery. And look at the subtitle. We intentionally had a subtitle, An Elusive Dream. Okay. A lot of people misunderstand by using nanoparticle, you can cure cancer. But where is the evidence? Okay. Another book is to talk about what kind of biomaterials, polymers we can use, how to modify the biomaterial surface to make a better cancer delivery system. So a few years ago, in 2013, the editor of ACS Nano asked me to write a short perspective on nanotechnology on drug delivery. So I told him, it's not going to be a pretty one. <laughs> It's going to be rather nasty. And the editor said, that's exactly what I want. So, so I wrote it. Okay? So basically here I'm saying is that a lot of people misunderstand. As I said, the assumption nanoparticle will be somehow better than others is all they have without any evidence. Now, after 15 years, the result clearly showed that that assumption may not be valid. That's my point. And yet, people still continue to do so. That's what I'm trying to correct today. Okay? Now, I want to use my own data. Actually, it's a, a data from my collaborator at KIST. <clears throat> and here is a point. I'm not going to use any other data in the literature. There are tens of thousands of papers out there. But the data is almost the same. It's like a carbon copy. They are all the same. Result is all the same. Okay, so I'm going to use my own data. Here's the thing. Whenever you use a nanoparticle labeled with a fluorescent probe or any other, you can see, take a picture, and you can see that while tumor side, nanoparticles are more brightly shining. Therefore, the more drug is going there. And if you measure tumor size growth, this control, tumor size increase, but by having nanoparticle, tumor size decrease. Every single paper out there, tens of thousands of paper, the conclusion is the same. Therefore, this nanoparticle is effective. And if you look at the control mouse dies after 20 days, but nanoparticle treated mouse lives longer. We have two issues here. One. Suppose we, as they claim, we treat the tumor in the mouth. The problem is this. Even the most generous Obamacare doesn't cover mouse. <laughs> Even if you have a pet mouse, so precious, you have to cover yourself. Second, even in the mouse, we didn't cure tumor here. Okay? Look at this. It simply slowed down. It never goes to zero. You never make a mouse live forever. Right? It's not the treatment. So another question is, if this is so effective, why don't you have another injection right here and continue to inject so the mouse can continue to live? Why do you show only about 20 days or only about months? That's the maximum they have. Look at every single paper. All they show is one month, just like this. Okay? So, this clearly is not the case for human. Okay? That's why any of this data in the mouse cannot be translated into human. Okay? Now, people ignore the lack of translation to human and continue to produce the same data. Okay? This is what we need to discuss. Now, the reason it happened is this. Basically, in the beginning, too much cancer cells are right here. You introduce nanoparticle. Cancer cells are right there. Where does nanoparticle go other than to tumor cells? 
And they call it targeting. That's the first mistake. Cells are right here, and, and drug is right there, and that is not really targeting that we think of, but they call it targeting. That's where all the missing began. When they introduced the nanoparticle into the mouse, yeah, this is a total 100% drug delivered to <coughs> mouse. And if it's not nanoparticle, only about 1% drug goes to tumor. If it's nanoparticle, about 2%. I'm very generous, so I increase to 5%. Still, 95% or more goes to somewhere else, okay? And this is why we cannot cure tumor in the mouse, first of all. And this data is used to use nanoparticle in humans, okay? This is where none of them works. Look at all this clinical study out there, it doesn't work, okay? This is what I'm talking about. In the beginning, 15 years ago, when there's no clear data, it is okay to assume that, well, nanoparticle has a great potential, that's fine. But 15 years later, we cannot still talk about nanoparticle has a great potential. What potential? Are you gonna talk about 15 years later the same potential? Nanotechnology potential is same as potential that any one of us can become a hundred million dollars a millionaire by buying power lottery. If you buy a ticket for power lottery, you have potential to be a millionaire, right? Somebody's winning power lottery. So that's real. But are you gonna rely on that potential? Nobody's gonna do that, right? So when we talk about potential, it's okay in the beginning, but after 15 years, you have to rethink everything we have done. And that is exactly my point. So right now, what is happening is so-called technology overshooting. People just make an nanoparticle more and more complicated in the hope that it works. This is what is wrong now, okay? We really have to rethink. Okay. So we need to really understand exactly what the problem is and how we're gonna change it. So let me show you invisible gorilla. I, I'm sure you, you have, many of you may have seen it. If not, go to YouTube and type invisible gorilla. You're gonna see a dozen of different variations, but this is one of them. This is called the selective attention test. And here are several players and the the instruction is count how many times the players are wearing white shirt past the basketball. So I actually went through and actually count the number of balls passed between white players. And so question is how many passes did you count? I had the correct answer. I'm not that dumb, I had the correct answer. Next question, but did you see gorilla? No, I didn't. Gorilla passing by, stand there a few seconds, even say hi to you, and I didn't see it. According to statistics, more than 75% people don't see gorilla. Okay? Because we're so focused on counting balls. The point is that if you focus on certain thing, you tend to not see the rest of it, which may be more important. Okay? So this is basically what we have. I call it scientist invisible gorilla syndrome. The first is positive illusion, basically seeking out what you want to see. If you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. That's what it is. The opposite side of the problem is inattentional blindness. In other words, motivated blindness. It is basically I don't wanna see if the data doesn't fit my goal, okay? You just avoid the data. That's inattentional blindness. So if you combine positive illusion and inattentional blindness, it ends up illusion of rationality, okay? Basically, you accept the data because it fits what I think right now. But if data doesn't fit, then, well, it's not important, you know, just ignore it. That's what 
many of us do. Whether we realize or not, that's many of us do every day. Okay? We just pick up the data, only the data we like. Okay? And this is prevalent now in most of nanotechnology research because we have a certain frame of thinking. If data fits there, that's the end. We don't want to think about anything else. This is, in fact, the problem for all of us. I'm not the only one who's saying this, OK? I'm not, uh, I'm not really as good person as this person, so I just say, you know, people make a mistake, or you have an illusion of rationality, all these things. But this person, her name is, I think, Veronique Kimmer. She's a director of review service. Well, she worked in the Nature Group. You know, all, she handles all the manuscripts, so she may, may have seen so many papers. And this is her article, published in 2014 in Scientific American. She starts from uh, development of Gleebeck, which is a cancer drug. Gleebeck is actually one of the wonder drugs the patient take, cancer patient take every day, then they live forever. Like a diabetic patient taking insulin every day, they live without a big problem. Gleebeck does that too. Okay. So Gleebeck development was done. The rationale was gene A leads to protein B, which leads to function C. So we do something about protein B, so we cure certain cancer. And that was Gleebeck. It worked fine. But that was 1970s. Now, she continued to say, biological processes do not work in linear ways independently of one another, but in tightly interconnected network. Layers of regulatory control constantly change the nature and abundance of molecular players. Basically, biological system is so complicated we just don't know what we don't know. Okay. So her conclusion is that in such noisy systems, it is easy to mistake a chance observation. Chance observation, sometimes it works, most times it does not, but chance observation for robust biologically meaningful effect. So scientists cannot be too careful to avoid falling prey to their own enthusiasm. This is illusion of rationality, okay? Exact the same thing, but description is a little better way than I did. But this is what we have now. We really have to change. Let me give you one example of positive illusion. This is a George Bush smiling. You know, when presidents take a picture, they usually smile. In the public places, we pick, see the president pictures. So there's nothing wrong assuming that George is smiling, right? The question here is, is he really smiling? Do you ask, is he really smiling? Let me show you whether George is smiling or not, okay? This is exactly the same two pictures, okay? So let me turn one picture upside down. This is George Bush, clearly not smiling, but this is George Bush when he found out that Iraq, after all, does not have WMDs. <laughs> so assuming just because what you see is what you think doesn't mean it's correct, okay? So this is what we really have to change, especially as a scientist. And the, you may ask a question then, why do we have to worry about all this? What does it have to do with me? Okay? When some scientists have uh, some illusion, so what? Why, why does it, how does it affect me? That's a common a, a question, right? You may ask the same question. Well, somebody may do whatever they like to do. How does it affect me? But the answer is that it really affects all of us. Okay? The reason is this, for example, if Nanotechnology, as everybody said, is an enabling technology. Can it really allow us to develop treatment for many important diseases, 
For example, how can you make a real progress to these areas? How can you make a progress in treating diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, drug abuse, heart disease, ocular disease? You know, you must have your family members, colleagues, friends, somebody has an Alzheimer's problem or Parkinson's disease. We need to find a cure for this. If we spend the limited resources to so-called nanotechnology in doing the same thing over and over again, we are diverting necessary funding in these areas to those. So this will affect all of us. Okay, so we need to really be careful in doing our research. I'm sure everybody has a good goal to develop something useful for everybody, but we really have to understand you know, once you know 15 years later things doesn't work, it's time to change, okay? So we really need to change at this point to really deal with the important disease. The question is, how can we change? Obviously, we have to think in new boxes, okay? We are not just thinking outside the boxes. We need a new frame of thinking. All the frame of thinking is now working. We need to have a new frame of thinking that is thinking in new boxes. And we also have to have an attitude of a doubting everything. It's not because we are bad or because we don't trust others. When somebody says something, we need to make sure that is exactly what it is. So it is so-called methodological skepticism. We have to really make sure whatever somebody's saying is actually true. Yeah? Just because somebody's saying something don't ask a question, you do the same thing. That is exactly what's happening in nanotechnology right now. Just because a famous person in somewhere is doing this, he published a paper, you don't even question. You don't even question the validity of that article and just keep doing the same thing. That's not the scientist should be, but that's what it is now. Okay? So when we teach students, we have to really make sure they ask a question. Okay. Nothing is really true until you make sure it's true. What is the best way then to move forward? You know, all this research is basically evolution. Just like a nature evolved, research always evolves too. Research evolution is based on trial and error. We try something, it doesn't work, try another thing, it works, we just try more. Okay. But now we need to try something other than nanotechnology. That's my point. Okay? Let's just think about something new so that we can try many different things so that if you fail, we try another one and so on. Okay? So that is the message I'd like to present today. Okay? Let's think about something new, try more, so that even if we fail, we can try many different things so we can find a better solution. One of the things I like to really uh, emphasize is never quit. Like a lot of times, you know, um, it's tempting to quit because things are not easy. Even if you have a passion in what you do, sometimes things are not easy, then, well, I'm going to quit. Then, you know, that's the end. So the reason you should never quit is that if you quit, you're done, right? So you, you have to keep going. So. Onward is a book uh, written by Howard Schultz, who is the founder of a Starbucks Coffee. Okay, look at this. When he tried to raise money in the very beginning to open the first shop in Seattle, he has talked to 242 investors. He said, I was turned down by 217 of the 242 investors I initially talked to. You have to have a tremendous belief in what you're doing and just persevere. If you are turned down 90% of the time, almost everybody just quit, okay? But he believed in what he did. He kept just going on, and finally he opened the first shop, successful, another shop, and throughout the world, okay? So everybody, successful athletes or whoever, they always say the same thing, never quit, okay? Look at, for example, Jack Nicholas, the best golf ever, resolved never to quit, 
never to give up, no matter what the situation. Even if you're losing five shots, who never, you never know, okay? So you just keep going, that's most important. So to, as I said, to try something new and fail, um, you know, you should not be afraid of failing because failing is daily routine for me. So failing doesn't bother me, okay? I don't really care about failing. Another reason is, as I said in the beginning, I don't compete with others. I compete with myself. So if I fail, so what, okay? So we keep going. One of the things I do is, right now is a digital human project. This is actually the idea came when I talked to uh, Professor Tong Rai Lee there in pharmacy. Because the animal study, mouse study, doesn't really present the prediction in human study, is there any better way? So how about building a whole human in, on a computer? That's how we started. It will take a long time. It will take, you, this project will probably never end because you're getting better and better, but it will never end, okay? But anyway, our goal is to uh, reproduce the human system on the computer so that we can test the efficacy of a drug and drug formulations, okay? So it will take some time. And thanks for George, uh, we had the initial set of funds together with the Korean Institute of Science Technology as well as Samsung Medical. So we have enough fund for the next two years. Another two projects I wanna do is this. From now on, you take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, okay? This is the holy grail of development. <clears throat> I wanna develop a smart pill formulation so that anybody who take this pill will become smarter. And experimental study will be very easy because if this smart pill formulation works, then mouse will start reading scientific journals. <laughs> the reason I'm trying to develop this formulation is this. I'd like to give this formulation to congressmen and senators in Washington, D.C. <laughs> so that they can at least read the bills they pass. <laughs> Nowadays, they don't even read what they pass. Okay. Another pill is so-called the use pill. Everybody wanna be, you know, stay young, so this is gonna be a huge market out there. So that's what I'm gonna, I'm working on. I actually had the formulation, but it has uh, some serious side effects. So it will, it will slow down the aging, but not all over the body. This is a result of testing. <laughs> so I'm not gonna sell this yet, but we'll continue to work on it. But finally, at the end of the day, actually, what I wanna say to me is that if I reach the best of me as I have been doing, then I know I've been doing good. So when I, try, when I read the book, The Art of Possibility, he described Justice Marshall. He's the first African-American Supreme Court Justice who was instrumental in ending the racial segregation. So when he retired, the reporter asked him, what is your greatest achievement? He simply said, I did the best I could with what I had. What can be better than this, okay? It's not about how many bills he passed, I'm not, he's not participating, but how many, you know, decisions he made and so on. It's none of those. He just did the best he could with what he had. That's probably anybody can do, okay? So once, this book is actually a very nice book. This book is written by Benjamin Zander, who is a conductor of Boston Philharmonic, with his wife, who is a psychiatrist. Anyway, if you can say, I did the best I could with what I had, you are lifting yourself above all this success and failure ladder, and you actually free yourself. This is the same thing as Whitney Houston, I will be free, okay? So, uh, as I said before, I, am not, I have not and I will not compete with others. It's not the point at all to me. I keep competing with myself, try to be better. So 
I hope that some of this uh, will be helpful to especially young scientists. You know, you will not, you don't have to compete with others. I have a case where several years ago, one faculty told me, you know what, I'm not doing as well as another faculty in our department. So I told them, just don't compare you with yourself with others. There's no point of it. Just do what you want to do. And now he's better than the other person here compared in the beginning. Okay. So anyway, I hope that I, I convey uh, some of my thought uh, to you today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. I'm not sure whether you have any question or not, but I'll be happy to answer a question, yeah. Well, I, 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 whenever I teach students, you have to ask a question, but <laughs> okay. nobody else is going, yes? Great, nice talking about the part. Could you just comment on what you're doing to help Yeah, I, I have been uh, publishing about this for the last few years, and I also um, I am invited to many places throughout the world, uh, Asia, and in, in many places in USA. Each time I talk about this. And three years ago, when I talk about this, first response was that, so you are pessimist. So my answer was, since when scientists do things, whether because you're pessimist or optimist, scientists do everything based on data. Data just doesn't show that. Now the people start understanding. So it has been a while, for at least three years, and people still, <laughs> resist to change, and that's understandable because you are very comfortable with right now because you have a certain system, certain frame of thinking, experimental data you have a, that meets a certain thinking, you can publish it, so you increase the number of publication. And actually I talked to one assistant professor in, in a rather good university in East Coast. We talked about this and he said, Frankly, I, I agree with you, agree with me, but he said, but what can I do? I need to publish a paper to get tenure. What can I do? So we have to understand this. It's a change, it cannot be overnight, but we have to change even though slowly by talking about this so that people start changing their ideas. It may change time, but one year faster change will save one year of a waste of money, right? So that's why I um, keep talking about this. So other than publishing, talking about it, I don't know what else I can do, but hopefully people keep talking about this. Huh? Very inspiring talk, the best part. So I'm very interested in this human digital uh, project. Can you come a bit more about the future and the potential? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, yes. Actually, we had the first symposium last year, August 15. Well, we're going to have a second symposium next week, next Tuesday. Tammy is here too. But by the way, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> She's a due Monday. Monday. Okay, wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to have a second symposium on digital human right here from 9 p a.m. for two days. So you, I'm sorry I did send you uh, information, but if you send me email, I will send you all the information, okay? So you're, you're welcome to join, okay? Anybody who interested in digital human can come, okay? So we, we provide lunch and drinks and everything, so. Okay. So do you wanna, do you wanna mention some of the long-term goals? I mean, this project is the digital human project. It's incredibly exciting. Um, happy to be involved in it. But yeah, just what are uh, well, yeah. Again. Well, uh, again, yeah, yeah. Again, the long-term goal is to 
You know, as I said before, drug development is very expensive. On the average, one drug on the market costs one billion dollars. But not all drugs make money, and that's why drug price is so high, because pharmaceutical company has to make money somewhere so that they can put back into research, okay? So one drug, one tablet costs $20 when raw material costs only two cents is ridiculous, but that's the nature of the game. You have to charge it somewhere so that you maintain the research for the future. A lot of people complain about high drug prices. There is a reason to it, but without that profit, they cannot place to put the money into research. If they don't put the money into research, if you have a new disease, new bacteria, none of the antibiotics work, what are you going to do? We need to develop those things. Antibodies against uh, Ebola, antibodies against something. This is why we, we have to have uh, pharmaceutical companies have some profit. Okay? But anyway, it costs too much, so we want to reduce the time to develop new drug so that cost of $1 billion can be reduced to $300 million and it's faster. And I think uh, by using this as a human, we can reduce the number of actual clinical study which costs so much money. Phase three clinical study costs $300, $400 million easily. And then they fail. The chances of a fail success of phase three, you pass phase one, two, you go to phase three, chance is only 50%. Yeah. So it's very, very low. So to reduce the drug development cost, we want to replace a human being with digital human. Yeah. So I think this is computing power is not the issue anymore. So I think it's all about what kind of idea we put into this digital human so we can pick making digital human better and better. So in the near future, we can actually replace human being but our short-term goal is to make a digital human good enough to test the drug absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, did you decide the name of your baby? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Are you pushing for a particular name? Or? Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't know. We're still taking suggestions. Okay, okay. We have a couple days. Well, how about digital? <laughs> More of a girl name. Oh, girl name, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, digit, digital may work, right? <laughs> yeah. Like Epita. Okay. Thanks, thank you for coming. Thanks so much. Bye bye. <laughs>